So uh, this talk is uh, really, I'd like it to, to be somewhat of a discussion if we can uh, make it so, because there's, there's some things that we need to discuss as Fedora surrounding Kubernetes and uh, uh, OpenShift, uh, specifically around you know how are we going to get this stuff uh, onto uh, Fedora, or how do we get it onto Fedora, how do we keep it updated, and then you know, getting the, the uh, software onto Fedora, in Fedora, is it enough? We also have to configure it uh, on Fedora and deploy it and maintain it and all that. So first, just a bit, you know, why Kubernetes containers are like ultra hot. It's the new you know, generation. It's the new future, everything. So for all the people <laughs> who are psyched about containers and wanting to run container, uh, their applications in containers, uh, if you're going to really do it, you need to, your apps need to span multiple hosts. Um, you know, you're not going to run your production app on your individual, uh, you know, MacBook or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and Kubernetes is great for this. Uh, you, uh, you take your container and, uh, or multiple containers if you want them to share resources together in a pod. You toss it to the cluster and um, uh, it gets scheduled on one of the nodes that can handle it. You've got services to make sure that the network traffic goes the right way. Uh, so it works well. And a lot of communities have adopted it, and specifically a lot of c communities that are important to Fedora. Uh, project Atomic, which is this umbrella project that uh, puts out uh, Atomic hosts, and, um, and uh, a lot of other kind of container-ish uh, technologies kind of fit into that umbrella has been shipping uh, in Fedora Atomic and also CentOS Atomic. They've been shipping Kubernetes uh, as part of the host from the beginning of those projects. Uh, in Fedora, we have a Fedora Atomic work group, and Kubernetes is part of what we do there. Uh, Red Hat has you know, huge investments in Kubernetes through OpenShift. OpenShift is based on Kubernetes. There's also like just a ton of really cool projects happening all the time. And one of the projects that uh, I'm really interested in right now is called Kubevert, and it is about running uh, virtual machines along with all of the live migration and all of the, the stuff that we expect to get out of you know, a virtualization system, but using Kubernetes to do the scheduling and stuff. So, and that's one that I'm particularly interested in, but there's just a ton of activity around Kubernetes. And you know, just in the kind of container community in general, a ton of action around Kubernetes. So I mean, that's why we're talking about it. It, it matters for Fedora for all those reasons. So this is an important point. You know, OpenShift Origin is based on Kubernetes, but uh, they are different. Uh, they they do some different things. And you know, I've found personally that uh, it's difficult to be deeply paying attention to Kubernetes and OpenShift Origin at the same time. I mean, you kind of just as an individual contributor need to make some decisions about where you're going to place your attention and efforts. And since I've been working with Project Atomic and Fedora Atomic and Cetos Atomic, and since Kubernetes is, comes baked into those images, uh, you know, from the start, it's like, hey, if we're shipping this on our image, it better work. So I have put a lot of my effort into uh, Kubernetes, you know, more than, than OpenShift. And, uh, you know, that's why. But um, and kind of some of the reasons why you might run one or the other, I kind of linked it to some of the Fedora Foundation <laughs> values. You know, first, if you want just the very latest stuff, Kubernetes leads OpenShift Origin. Uh, you know, it, it's on, on average, it's about a release ahead of where OpenShift Origin is. Even though OpenShift has, you know, that gap has gotten smaller over time, that's just um, that the leading edge stuff is in Kubernetes first. Also on the friends uh, point, Kubernetes is just super popular. I mean, even if we decided that in Fedora we wanted to mainly focus on origin, which whatever, that, that would be cool. Uh, we, can't, we have to have a story for Kubernetes around Fedora. Kubernetes is just massive, and a lot of people want to run that. And we can't just turn them away you know, or, or tell them, oh, just go use Ubuntu or something. Uh, yeah, or CentOS or something other. I mean, Fedora has to have some kind of game plan, even if it is docs to show you how to use the upstream well. Uh, you know, why you might want to use Origin, you know, uh, again, going back to some of the Fedora Foundation's features, it adds on some really cool features on top of the base Kubernetes. 
I mean, uh, a lot of stuff around uh, the kind of build pipeline stuff, uh, really slick UI. It's got like a real good kind of a, a self-service story. If I, if I was going to be running a cluster and exposing it to multiple people, uh, I would want to use OpenShift for that uh, just to help me manage, uh, you know, using, using that stuff together. Uh, on the friends, Jeff, you know, uh, it's uh, not, uh, you know, I think it's not, not uh, it's safe to say that it is not as popular as playing Kubernetes is on its own. I mean, the, it just says that Kubernetes has a bigger kind of mindshare footprint. But we have a lot of friends working in OpenShift. A ton of Red Hatters are working on it, and they're doing awesome work. I mean, there's totally, I mean, there's great documentation. The Ansible scripts are really great. There's just a ton, there's a lot of goodness to be had in uh, OpenShift. And also because it is kind of coming from a, you know, Red Hat, Fedora place, uh, a lot of the ways that OpenShift works kind of fit well with, not surprisingly, kind of the way that Fedora works. So there's, there's a lot of good stuff to be gained there. And for an individual contributor, there's good reasons why you want, might want to kind of focus on that. I mean, Fedora can and should and does do both, but, it, but it, for both Kubernetes and OpenShift, there are, places, there are things that we're not doing and there are things that we could be doing better. Uh, but we got to have contributors to, to do the work. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a key, obviously, to everything. So I kind of broke down to the three parts, kind of the pieces that are involved in the Kubernetes origin story on Fedora. And it first starts with just the, the software itself. Uh, Kubernetes, every time there's a release, they release binaries for all the components. And there are a lot of releases. Like right now, there are you know, considered to be supported active releases, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, and there's 1.8, like alpha uh, release right, right now. So I mean, that's four releases worth paying attention that people who are interested in, in uh, Kubernetes are going to be looking for on some level. Each one of those has these kind of Z streams, and those come out pretty frequently. Uh, and so for all of those releases, you can go to Kubernetes and grab the binary. Uh, I mean, that's, that's cool. Also, multiple architectures. A lot of installation methods, they, they, they expect to be able to say, OK, go give me 1.6.7. Give me 1.5.3 you know, or whatever. And so there's kind of this expectation that all these binaries are going to be available somewhere. And they are upstream. It's similar with OpenShift Origin. They provide binaries, but uh, there are fewer individual releases. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit easier to uh, kind of keep track of. The thing about using the upstream binaries, maybe like, for instance, again, was our Fedora story? We could just say, OK, go and grab the binaries from the project. You know, if you want to build an RPM, grab the, the pre-built binary and dump it into an RPM and use that. The problem with that is that you know, these are outside of our control. We ship things that come from our build systems. Sometimes we want to patch things. So you know. We, there are reasons why we don't want to just use plain upstream binaries. So we do have Fedora RPMs, and we've had them since the, the beginning. And uh, we get to distribute what we built. We get to patch things. Uh, uh, but we haven't been tracking. Like I said, there are these you know, four releases worth paying attention to at a time, you know, three just kind of stable ones. We're not tracking all those super closely. And uh, we bump against issues with uh, the way that we do packages. Each pack, we have a Kubernetes package. And so we can kind of have F25, F26, and Rawhide are kind of the, the places where we have, where there can be separate Kubernetes packages. And then we can do things like do Kubernetes, you know, Kube15, Kube16. I mean, you know, we can, there's different things we can do. We're not doing that right now. We're just, so, but in Fedora 25, in Atomic, we kind of, uh, we kind of uh, pay attention to the latest stream. So basically, Fedora 25's Kubernetes is 1.5. something, I'm not sure. But it's not the current 1.5 stream point release. Uh, and then in Fedora 26, right now, we have 1.6. 1.7 is an update to testing. So when that goes stable, we're going to have that shift from you know, that point release. So there are things that. We're bumping up against the issues like that there. Now, modularity, 
might help because it, it gives us a scheme to say, instead of saying there's an F25, F26, F27 package, there could be modules based on cube 15, cube 16, cube 17, et cetera. And we could, especially you combine that with containers, that gives us a way to sort of satisfy this expectation that I should be able to go out and grab a particular version of Kubernetes, the one that I want. And again, origin, we have Fedora RPMs for origin. And you know, they, they move at a slower pace. And it's more, you know, it, it's, uh, we track the latest Fedora, uh, the latest origin you know, release pretty well uh, in Fedora, I think. OK, so you know, that's like where the binaries are coming from themselves. But the, and I should say, too, about the, the Fedora RPMs. You know, one thing that we can do to help us track better and that individual contributors can do is uh, keep an eye on Bodhi. Uh, you know, it, we do not, we often don't have like fast, timely karma to get pri uh, releases from one to the next. So even if we did uh, update the Kubernetes in F25, it would probably sit there, I mean, it would probably sit there indefinitely without enough karma to get pushed to stable just based on the, you know, the current level of kind of you know, testing that we're getting just from individual contributors. I mean, that's an area. If we want this to move faster and more efficiently, and even if, if modularity solves some of our versioning issues, we still need the testing. Uh, we still need contributors around that. So the packaging part. You can do no packaging. You can just copy binaries to user bin local, and you can run them. You can make a system D unit file. Uh, Dan, in his talk, mentioned Kubernetes the hard way. Uh, Kelsey Hightower's uh, really popular how-to. And that's what he does. He's, he says, go to Kubernetes, download binaries, drop them in user bin local, write these unit files, and uh, you, you know, go from there. Uh, there's this hypercube image. This is a super popular way to deploy uh, Kubernetes. A lot of different uh, uh, installers use this. And, uh, and it, it's one binary that, that basically is, that, uh, does all of the jobs, scheduler, API server, client. You can uh, use that one binary to run all the, uh, all the different uh, roles. Uh, now, from upstream, it's one of the most common ways that Hypercube gets used is Upstream makes a Hypercube image, and it's Debian base, plus uh, the Hypercube binary gets pulled in from there where their binaries are and goes out, and that's the image. And then they have one of those for every, you know, 1.5.3, 4, 5, you know, every single time they do a release, they have a corresponding image for that. And they're based on Debian. Now, we don't have a Fedora-based Hypercube image yet, we were, the way our, our, Fedora, our package uses, actually uses Hypercube for most of the components in our Fedora package, but it doesn't use it for the API server because the API server needs an additional capability to bind to 443, and so that was kind of broken out. And then to be less confusing, I guess, the ability to use the Hypercube binary as the API server was removed. So then that stopped me from being able to make a Hypercube image based on Fedora. But I, I talked to the maintainer and got that uh, changed. So I'm going to make an image for Hypercube so that you can, uh, if you wanted to, you know, use some of these insta same installers that require Hypercube, but you want to use Fedora uh, base image and Fedora RPM, you could do that. Uh, and in some places, some things are actually hard-coded to use the Kubernetes upstream, you know, Debian-based image. Uh, and and those, those, that would be a, a thing that we would need to patch. Uh, OpenShift Origin has an origin image that's like Hypercube, uh, and it's CentOS-based. Uh, I mean, unless I'm wrong, you know, someone uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I don't think OpenShift actually makes any uh, Fedora containers, you know, Fedora-based containers when they run in containers. They use CentOS. And so this kind of raises one of the questions that I want people to think about. And, you know, I mean, how do we feel about that? Is it, does it bother us that if the main way to use, like right now we have a, uh, well, I'll talk more about kubeadm in a second, but we have a kubeadm package in Fedora right now. But that package is hard-coded to use this upstream, you know, for, for some of its components, this Debian-based, 
image with the uh, upstream built binaries. Uh, or if you're going to use OpenShift on Fedora, you're going to be using CentOS-based images. I mean, I don't know. Do we care? This is a thing where uh, it's not the end of the world, I don't think. But if individual contributors think, no, we, I want it to be all Fedora, I mean, this is the sort of thing where people have to then, you know, do it. <laughs> you know, so uh, something to think about. All right, so Fedora RPMs are both a way of building the binary, but they're also a way of packaging it. And um, this has kind of been the default way that we have uh, installed Kubernetes on Fedora so far. Uh, and so we have the, the uh, we have a Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes package makes a Kubernetes master package and a Kubernetes node package and then a client package. And, uh, you know, the master runs on the master. It includes, it includes the three master services, and the node includes the two node services. Those RPMs have so far been built into the Fedora Atomic image, so they're baked in there. We're planning to remove them partly because uh, they can, they, if you don't need them, then they're, they're extra uh, kind of weight that we can get rid of. And if you, uh, you might want to run a different version, there are different things where you know uh, we will be we you know want to to move, remove them from the image, and we have other ways of getting them on there. Uh, there's package layering, which uh, Jerry mentioned briefly. It works pretty well. You know, RPM OS free Kubernetes would uh, if your system didn't already have Kubernetes on it. I believe there's a way to now do some overrides that's here or coming, and uh, you can. So that's a way that you can use the plain RPMs. And the RPMs are cool. They're managed by System D. Uh, the, the, we have Ansible scripts out there that use those that expect to use it that way. Uh, and um, you know, similarly, uh, I mentioned before about uh, the Fedora. We have OpenShift RPMs uh, for Fedora, and that's been we've been maintaining those pretty well. So you can use the RPMs in uh, you know, further level of packaging in containers. So uh, I uh, maintain in the Fedora registry per component images, uh, uh, so for the API server, for the controller manager, for you know, each of the components based on Fedora RPMs. And I have, have uh, made those so they can run just as a regular Docker container or as a system container. And so if you're running it as a regular Docker container, you can just write a unit file that uh, will, will you know, run the containers from the unit file. You can also make a Kubernetes uh, manifest that you can drop in the, uh, the kubelets manifest directory. And when the kubelet starts up and, and looks in there to see what things I have to start up, and it can start up its, the master uh, components. Uh, those are, and then the, I have made them with an eye toward, like particularly with the system containers, uh, an eye toward making them drop in replacements for the RPMs. So when you install it, like, uh, the name of what a package might be is Kubernetes dash API server, but when I install it as a system container, I do you know, dash dash name cube dash API server because that's the name of the system uh, D service that uh, the RPM would install. So that then, if you're running, if you have a script or something that was expecting that one, it just replaces it. So one thing with these, and and so this is similar to the issues I mentioned around the building of the RPMs. You know, we need some better versioning and tagging. Right now in our, uh, our the Fedora build system, we are just, uh, we, we want to add automatic version, uh, uh, we want to add, uh, add it where the build system will automatically uh, put the correct version of the, of the package in, the, in a tag. Uh, we're not doing that right now. But this is a thing that, again, people are expecting when they're coming from the upstream side Upstream has every single release, and they have the, the, the component, the architecture, and the release uh, number. And so people expect to be able to access Kubernetes in that way. And that's something that we need to work on, uh, tagging that, that matches those expectations. And again, I mentioned before modularity. This is going to, I think, uh, help. I I've, I've spent a, a, for about just the, like, the last week and a half or so I've been looking at you know, building some uh, building a module for Kubernetes, and uh, it's still a little early days, I think, for modularity. But I think that's going to be a big help. 
Uh, and then I mentioned before, uh, unless I'm wrong, there is no Fedora-based OpenShift origin container. Uh, and that's something that, you know, I think should exist. You know, I think that, that you know, we as Fedorans should want that. And that's something that we'll have to do. Okay, so the actual deployment part. You know, we, we've been including the, uh, you know, packages in the Atomic Host since the beginning, so you just download the Atomic Host and Kubernetes is on there, but uh, it's kind of involved actually getting it up and running. And uh, so you can start from scratch. A lot of people really want to do this, especially when they're getting started. Like, I think Ansible is crazy easy. And, you know, once you get a little bit of the hang of it, you know, you can pretty well see what's going on. But a lot of people who I talk to in IRC, they're just like, uh, don't make me... I mean, I know it, how they don't want to learn a new configuration management system. It's like when I was doing stuff with RDO, and I was like, I have to understand Puppet, you know? And uh, even though Ansible is much easier, I think, than that, uh, until you invest a little bit of time to start to not be afraid, you know, afraid of it, or, you know, it can turn people off. And also, people want to understand. You know, they, want to, they don't want a scripted install. They want to see exactly what's happening, and that's totally understandable. So I mentioned this Kubernetes the hard way. I mean, Kelsey Hightower is like a total luminary in the Kubernetes world, and a ton of people reference and read his uh, this how-to. And a, a thing about the how-to, though, is that it's all about Debian. It's all about the upstream binaries. It's all about Google Cloud. I mean, it, it just sort of punts on some sort of hard topics because Google Cloud just magically does that part, which is you know, he works for Google. I mean, that's it's a totally legit way to go about it. I mean, Google is a great way to get your feet wet with it, you know. But uh, I thought that, you know, it would be cool to do a version of it and kind of draft off his efforts, but just change the bits that need to be changed to make it work with Atomic. So I started a fork of it, and uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's something, it might be worth thinking about, we talked about a little bit about thinking about kind of including that in, in our more official atomic documentation or, you know, looking at the strategy of kind of drafting off of this popular existing from scratch effort. Because I'm personally not very interested in from scratch installation. I like Ansible, but uh, I recognize that it's important. We have a, a Project Atomic Getting Started guide, which is also a from scratch thing, uh, but it needs work. It's a pretty... Uh, it just, uh, it, it was written a, a while ago, and it had, there's some things that it doesn't do, and you know, this sort of thing requires maintenance. This is, again, part of why I like the idea of drafting off of somebody else's, you know, efforts in part, because we can um, minimize, you know, the maintenance that's, that's required. Okay. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's uh, done by the OpenShift team, right? Oh, right. Okay, good. And now that is a, like a from scratch uh, origin setup? Yeah, that's what I, th I mean, I, I, that's what I thought, because I, I had kind of looked around, and everything kind of points you to Ansible, which, again, I'm totally down with, but, you know. What's that? Okay. Yeah, okay. Speaking of which, so Minikube and Minishift. Now this is a this is a, a great way to get started. I think it's a single node cluster, uh, which whatever. I mean, I think if you're if uh, personally, I mean, if I, I want to get started with something more than single node because that's the whole point. But but you know, I think there's some value to it still. But you're running it in a VM, and so it's very cross-platform friendly. They've got instructions for using it with all sorts of hypervisors. Now it's not Fedora based like at all. You're using the boot to Docker VM by default, so you're using you're not using Fedora, you're not using our Docker. Your uh, it pulls in a uh, uh, like a Docker local, it's like a uh, or a cube local. There, there's a binary that it pulls in that's running Kubernetes in a local setting, uh, and that's from upstream. Uh, Minishift can use a CentOS VM, so that's getting closer to us. And if you use this VM driver 9 and you're running on Fedora, you're using your host's Docker, so you're running it on Fedora then. So that's, a, that's more of a Fedora thing. So 
this might be something, you know, again, this might be something that uh, might be worth Fedora saying, uh, well, we want to have a really super easy way to get started for people, and so maybe. Yep, I, I think that might be in like two slides. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one too. No, 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 that's the, thank you. So uh, this is where MiniQ and MiniShift live. Um, and it's the same thing, it's just MiniShift is the OpenShift version of it. So KubeADM, this is pretty cool. This is, uh, you can have a single node cluster or you can have a multi-node cluster. You can start your first node and then you can add additional nodes. Uh, it's not high availability. You're, you have your master, unless I'm wrong, but you have your master, and then you can add additional nodes to it. It's considered beta. It's kind of been considered beta for a, a little while, and I guess there's like a mixture of different things that it uses that aren't considered fully GA yet. I mean, I'm told that this is kind of the future of uh, deploying Kubernetes, and it's really nice. Uh, as... Uh, distributed by the upstream. It uses uh, kind of a mixture of installed RPMs or they support CentOS and Debian uh, in their docs and, and, the RP and the packages they offer. Uh, so, uh, but when you run it on CentOS, they have CentOS RPMs for, the, for kubeadm and for a, uh, a container networking interface package and for the kubelet. And then it uses the hypercube image for the rest of it. So you, you get the kubelet started and it pulls down the hypercube. Uh, a month or two ago, we got a cube ADM in Fedora, and uh, there was an issue with the way that they were doing the packaging that made their packages not work with Atomic Host. So uh, we got that addressed, and uh, you can use package layering to get cube ADM on. But, when you, but uh, in the Go source of cube ADM, it's like, it specifies the, the, the Google image repository. So that's something that we would have to patch to use a Fedora-based hypercube. So again, you know, and then I have a, in the, uh, the Atomic System Containers uh, repo under Project Atomic, I have a pull request that I have to, uh, you know, address some of the feedback I've got for a kubeadm system container where you can just install that on a system that has no Kubernetes on it and it will, um, you know, uh, you can run, what it basically does is drops the kubeadm binary into user bin local, and uh, so you run that, and uh, then it goes off and it starts the services it needs to. It runs the kubelet uh, uh, containerized, and then it runs the, uh, goes and grabs hypercube. So there's OC cluster up, so this is kind of the um, OpenShift answer to kubeadm, and this works really well too. Now. There, there are options for making, adding additional nodes to your, your single node. And I spent like an afternoon trying to get it working. And I, I mean, I, it was one of those things where I kind of got a bit closer, a bit closer, a bit closer, but uh, I didn't get all the way. So uh, it's there. And I think, uh, I think that uh, it's probably just a minor thing to, to be fixed. But, but that, that's a way, too, that you can you run the command, OC cluster up. And you're up uh, pretty quickly with a OpenShift cluster on your one system, and then you know pending you know this OC cluster join getting straightened out, you can add additional nodes to it. Um, this again is kind of a mix of installed RPMs and container images. Uh, you can install like when I run it on Fedora Atomic, well, you you can install through, through with package layering this Origin client that so gives you OC. And then when it'll go and pull down containers, and it pulls down the CentOS-based container. And uh, the one issue, though, is that Origin Clients includes a cube uh, control uh, tool, and that conflicts with the Kubernetes client package that comes installed by default right now on uh, Fedora Atomic. But if you like rebase to the Fedora Atomic 27 or Rawhide version of the repo, that's missing Kubernetes, and so you can install that cleanly uh, without that, that uh, conflict. And this would also be a good candidate probably for system containerization. I mean, I bet you I could take my kubeadm container and change a couple things, and bam, you know, have the OC, uh, the origin client's container, uh, you know, running. 
So, uh, and that's another, yet another opportunity for contrib <laughs> contribution. Okay, so contrib Ansible. In, in the Kubernetes contrib repo are Ansible scripts for installing Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes cluster. This is what I've always used the most, and I've contributed to this. Uh, you can uh, you can use this with system containers. Uh, well, so I say here that it supports multiple distros uh, for Fedora. It's uh, if you're running on it checks to see if you're running on Atomic. If you're not running on Atomic, it installs the RPMs. If you are, it assumes that they're there. You can use it with system containers, but you have to install the system containers first. I actually have a fork uh, of this that includes. The, a way to just to, to specify I want to use system containers and then it'll do that part automatically. And I was just waiting to send a pull request for the system containers to actually be released in, in the Fedora registry. But they are now, so I, I'm going to send that pull request. Uh, there's, uh, there's a Vagrant portion of it where you can run Vagrant and, and install it on VMs that are Vagrant. And you can use Vagrant plugins for OpenStack and AWS to install it there. But um, I don't know, it's a little hackier that you, that you have to go through Vagrant for those things. And really, it's, it's kind of, it's not a heavily active uh, set of scripts. And the sense I've got from talking to different people is that, you know, there's issues where, I mean, one issue is that you can run a, a multiple node etcd, but there, it doesn't support running uh, a highly available master. Uh, and there's talk about... Contrib is this big, weird, like crazy grab bag of a million different uh, projects. And I guess the idea in Kubernetes is that they need to start moving to more appropriate locations. There's talk of moving it under Cube Deploy. But I mean, this, is, this, is, this could use some attention and some opinion and some discussion about what's the future of this. This is what I use the most often myself uh, when I'm testing things. There's this other Ansible-based option called CubeSpray that is a Kubernetes incubator project. Uh, uh, they've got a bunch of different options for running it on AWS, on Google Cloud, Azure, OpenStack. Uh, it does support the high availability master. Uh, they support RHEL and CentOS, and it, it didn't work for me out of the box with Fedora, but it was like three or four changes I had to make to the Ansible to make it work. And uh, I saved the diff. Uh, I was looking at this like a week and a half ago. I saved the diff, and so I'll probably send them a pull request to fix those few things so it can work for Fedora. But uh, <laughs> a couple things here. One thing, I mean, they're, they, they're pulling the Hypercube images from CoreOS. And interestingly, I think the only, the only thing that I think that the reason why they do that is CoreOS does the exact same Hypercube image as Upstream does, except they give the whole Hypercube binary permissions to mount, to bind to lower network ports. Uh, and I mean, upstream, the idea is that instead of doing 443, you'll do like 6443 or something, so you don't have to have that. But uh, in the uh, Ansible, they have a place where you can change the registry that it comes from. So if we have a Fedora cube, a hypercube image, we could use this, and we could pretty easily uh, just point it to the use of Fedora. So, you know, if this is this seems to be much more active, so maybe uh, you know p those of us who've been focusing on contrib Ansible, maybe this is a place where we might want to think about turning our, our efforts and getting Fedora working well and setting forth zero. I mean, this is a thing. It's just um, I, I haven't looked deeper into this, but I'm pretty sure that this is would be easy to get SE Linux working. But I mean, people uh, in the Kubernetes community, there's just by and large people are not. Uh, super worried about <laughs> just tossing a throw NC Linux into permissive mode and they're getting started docs. I mean, it's it's pretty pervasive. And so uh, that's something that also needs to be uh, fixed if we're going to use this. Like the Contrib Ansible, uh, you know, when I first started using it, it was set in 4.0, but it's not now. <laughs> and it's not, it's not like, you know, total rocket science to get that working, but... Uh, it needs, again, contribution. So there's OpenShift Ansible on the OpenShift side of this. And it is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, you know, you've got the uh, uh, high availability etcd and high availability master. It's got a lot of activity. You know, a lot of Red Hatters are working on it. 
uh, there's the contrib repo that's got you know a ton of different um, docs and uh, additional Ansible scripts for running on these different platforms. This link I have here, uh, Dusty made, did a, a cool uh, uh, blog post. Uh, I guess it's getting a little bit dated now, but it'll probably still work on installing on Fedora 25 Atomic Host uh, OpenShift using OpenShift Ansible. You know, again, uh, you're using these, I guess you can use RPMs. Uh, I think I've installed it using containers, and you can use the system containers, uh, as uh, Jerry mentioned. These, this is the same slide about the options for that. Again, you know, these are the CentOS-based containers, you know. Uh, we have to decide, do we care about that? Uh, or, you know, maybe, maybe we're cool with it. Uh, but I, I've used this myself. Uh, I, like I said, I don't use OpenShift as, or, you know, test and contribute as heavily as I do to Kubernetes. But, uh, I mean, I've, I've, like, you know, when I look at this compared to the state of our uh, Kubernetes Ansible scripts, I think, gosh, you know, that's that's great, you know. <laughs> uh, and I and also I thought about, uh, and I've talked to some people about, can we, you know, jump in here? You know, can we basically get uh, uh, some mods to these scripts where if someone wanted to just install plain uh, Kubernetes on, you know, Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, uh, you know, could we toss that in the in the many options, you know, that that are there to uh, to do that? And that would be, uh, you know, that might be a place to place to put our contributions or our efforts uh, instead of some of these other places. And then I've got this slide about SE Linux. I mean, it's just like really, uh, uh, there's just a ton of set and force zero out there in the instructions. And it's just like, it's just easy to toss that in and then just never go back to it and say, oh, yeah. I mean, and sometimes I've tested things where you don't even actually like something has subsequently changed where that's gotten fixed and the, the documentation didn't get updated and it just kind of perpetuates this idea that SE Linux is uh, going to get in your way and it's not going to work. The way that I have gone about uh, uh, fixing a lot of things or at least you know getting things to where SE Linux can be enforcing is in the manif when things run as containers like um, network plugins or some of the Kubernetes add-ons. Uh, usually those are the things that, that give a, a problem with SE Linux, give, give you denials. And it, rather than just uncontaining everything, turning SE Linux off, you can run these containers, you can put in the, in the manifest, this, uh, make them run as SPCT, and just unconfine that specific container. Now it's better to have things contained properly, but uh, I just figured that rather than uh, you know turn off SE Linux on your entire host, it's better to uncon unconfine the particular thing, and then again, you know we need to work on you know getting it uh, contained properly. Uh, another thing is uh, sometimes it's uh, on Fedora the uh, it, you'll you'll be a plugin will be mounting a location on the host and. Uh, you, uh, you you might need to, ch uh, to uh, uh, change the context so that it's readable uh, by the uh, by the container uh, runtime. Uh, but I mean, I guess you know there can be issues with getting that to stick sometimes. And this isn't I'm not like an SE Linux master, but I am I do care about uh, having it disabled or permissive places and reversing that. And I've tried to do a little bit of what I can to kind of you know, get it get it at least uh, running on the host. Uh, but like, when you run kubeadm, you inst you initialize your your cluster, and then you need to set up. You need to choose a network plugin, and those run in containers. And just like every single network plugin uh, has some kind of issue with uh, SE Linux, uh, or th th at least that I've seen. And so, but it's just as simple. What I've done is, is like with uh, the flannel network plugin. I just gotten the plug-in and made a fork of it and just added the, the security option to run as uh, you know, SVCT, and then at least I can have the host uh, enforcing. But uh, we need help on uh, uh, you know, spreading the word and getting fixes out there uh, around that. So this is some places to contribute. Uh, in the uh, 
the atomic work group, we kind of set up a separate little Kubernetes SIG. And uh, on Peugeot here, this is our, uh, our uh, issue tracker uh, for that. And we're starting to track issues around um, that, that uh, relate to, that affect Kubernetes on Fedora and, and CentOS too. We're trying to pay attention to both. Uh, I mentioned Bodhi before. You know, you can at any time go and look for Kubernetes or other packages in this world that you care about and just see is there something waiting for karma in Bodhi and you can really help uh, by g testing it out and getting it karma. And uh, you know, and if it's not clear how to test it out, poke the maintainer or poke one of us in um, in Atomic, you know, in uh, Freenode, and ask us. And we'll, I mean, that's something that people should be poked about. Uh, this is the con contribution uh, page for OpenShift. Uh, Jerry had mentioned the uh, container guidelines. Uh, that's a good way to help out some of these things I mentioned that that you know we don't have a Fedora container for. That's where you can kind of start your journey of rectifying that. And then this last one the, uh, is a repo where we are doing atomic host documentation. And a lot of it relates to Kubernetes and OpenShift. And uh, uh, we, we had a, a virtual fad recently where we went through and we kind of uh, identified a bunch of things that we need. And then we hunted around and found reference materials. And we put them in a bunch of issues and uh, so that People who want to take one can see a blog post or something that's already been written and get it into shape. And we have an activity session this week. When, when is that, uh, Josh, when's that activity session to, to do some doc writing for Atomic Host? Uh, So tomorrow afternoon, we've got a. But um, yeah, but that that the contribution is really welcome there. So uh, that, that's. I mean, questions and also you know some of these things I've been asking about. I'm kind of curious, like to to hear what people think. I mean, does it bug you that? All right, tomorrow morning, 9:30, we're going to do a work session, writing up some docs or working over some atomic docs, and that'll include. Uh, helping to document some of this stuff, but I'm curious. I mean, people, what, what do you? How do you feel about? Feel free. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's kind of weird because the cube ADM, like when we when you run that, uh, when you run the from a, the Fedora package, like that's what we're distributing. But we're distributing something that in turn goes out and grabs something else. But then it, it's also when you run Kubernetes, you grab some other images from uh, from Google too. Yeah, I mean it's what the, the one trick when we if we do our own, then we have to contend with this thing where you do cube ADM and you do you know you, you give an argument to to give a particular version. And if that version doesn't exist in our in our registry, you know, I don't know what, what do we what happens then? Can we make it somehow that it fails over to use the upstream or, you know, but that's something we have to figure out. But it's it's there's a challenge because there's this quantity of releases happening, and it's just way more than we typically are set up to deal with in Fedora. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're, we're going to be completely dedicated to maintaining just Kubernetes and, and not some of the other options that are being presented. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a question that we have to answer. Do do we, it, I mean, <laughs> it, whether or not we set out to say we're only going to support these these ones and we say that, we then, through our contributions, only support, are only going to support what we actually support, you know? So, yeah, it's better that we say this is what we're going to do. And this is the thing, too, that I'd like to uh, consolidate as much of our efforts as possible. Like, if we were somehow able to get together with the OpenShift Ansible and, like, somehow be able to work together, you know, with, with doing origin stuff and cube stuff at the same time, that would be ideal. Because at least one thing we know is that they're both caring about our, you know, distro. And so, you know, because that's, that's one thing that... that you know, we can assume is that it's running on Fedora. But, yeah, I mean, th there's no way not to just support certain things because that's just the reality. But we should be clear about what we support. Because right now, when people show up to Project Atomic and they do the getting started guide and some stuff's out of date and then, you know, there's all these other ways to do it, you know, it's confusing and, and I, I, I'm afraid that we're giving people a bad experience. And also, we're not, we don't really direct people towards origin much at all in the Project Atomic or, you know, world. And there's a lot of Fedora-specific things, like I pointed out during the course of this, that are just, like, missing from the OpenShift origin kind of stack and experience. And again, maybe we're cool with them being missing or whatever, but this is, I'd like to at least be moving forward, you know, intentionally. All right, awesome. Thanks, everybody.